Howdy. The old kind of silly saying goes, to be rich, all you need is an idea. Not necessarily a good idea, just an idea. And while many inventions are created to solve a problem, most of these items do not fit that bill. The majority serve no purpose beyond making you regret your life decisions that led to the point of buying them. Or maybe they're just a bit of silly fun. Ah, it's so awesome! I want it! So let's check out 10 moronic items that made millions. And just a reminder, I'm only ragging on the inventions and certainly not the people who made them. This is all meant in good fun and I wouldn't want to stop anyone's creative flow. And thank you to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video. Later on, I'll tell you about this tasty cereal I've been eating. But for now, let's begin. Number 10. Laura! 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 Big Mouth Billy Bass. What's an idea that makes $100 million in one year? A cure for disease? A revolutionary new energy design? Perpetual motion? Oh no, those are just silly compared to this. No, in the 2000s, apparently this was what we all wanted. The Big Mouth Belly Bass. The plastic fish stuck to a board that sang and danced to you as you walked by. I know, I have no idea what was wrong with society, because I own one too. And every time you press the button, it would sing, take me to the river, or don't worry, be happy. Somehow, this became ridiculously popular in the late 90s and early 2000s. Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, and Queen Elizabeth were all said to have one hanging on their wall. It also appeared in popular movies like Wall-E, making it near impossible to forget. Here's a little song I wrote. But why? It's just an ugly, singing, animatronic fish. As silly as it may seem now, I can't deny there was an appeal to these things. It was a fish that was well known to recreational fishermen. So when a guy named Joe invented his singing fish, he chose the bass because it was most popular. He even spoke to a taxidermist to get the features just right. So when it was hung on the wall, Billy did look like a prize catch. So it was a real novelty and surprise when he suddenly started singing and dancing. The CEO of the company that made it said, It was like magic! People wanted to show their friends so that they could watch their reactions. The creator Joe also commented, It was one of the biggest novelty items of all time. Pet Rock was minuscule compared to Big Mouth Billy Bass. Billy was just this weird novelty talking point for friends and family. And there was a huge amount of value in that. He was so popular that for some reason there were even waiting lists for this thing. Without smartphones, I guess we were all that bored in the year 2000. And again, I make fun, but I also owned a big mouth belly bass. So who am I to talk? I apparently helped make this moronic novelty $100 million. <laughs> Number nine. Damn. The original Furby. You thought Minions and Minionese was annoying? In 1998, Tiger Electronics created something way worse. They gave us Furbies and Furbish. For a while, we could hear this nonsensical yammering insanity on every house shelf and in every second toy commercial. Because these weird hamster hour hybrids were a massive craze. In the first three years alone, 40 million Furbies were sold. In fact, the original Furbies were so successful that Tiger Electronics decided we needed an even more annoying spin-off. So they eventually released Furby Babies. Ugh which talked even more garbage baby talk gibberish. But despite all this, I have to admit, when they first came out in 1998, I was fascinated by the Furby. I found it amazing they appeared to be able to learn. And I can't deny it, I wanted one. But because it was more seen as a girl's toy by society, I never really had the guts to ask for one. Plus, there was another big issue we'll get to later. I found it very uncomfortable that these toys could turn themselves on at night. Luckily, I had a female friend who often showed me her one. Me? Was it me? Well, I thought you never had a Furby. Oh yeah, I never had one. Sad face. Oh, I'll get you one. We're actually up to the fourth generation of Furby now, and they're way more advanced. No, I don't want one now. But thank you, they're too scary. Yeah, back in the day, the original Furby cemented their reputation as Five Nights at Freddy's lookalikes. Nowadays in the fourth generation, Furbies do look a lot less creepy. 
But back in the early 2000s, all we had were these giant glaze-eyed nightmares. You could turn out the lights in your room and put it to sleep, but it was never truly asleep. They could, and sometimes would, turn back on in the middle of the night. Much like the Five Nights at Freddy's electronics, the original Furbies had no off switch. Why would they do this? In the early days of the internet, I still remember reading about a Furby toy that began sparking and making strange noises at night. They couldn't turn it off, and by the end, they'd stripped off its fur and shown the Furby's true, horrific appearance. But by second generation, Tiger Electronics had learned from their mistakes and actually given their toy an off switch. Shame Freddy's Pizzeria never tried this either. Probably would have saved them a lot on security guard paychecks. It also turns out the National Security Council was suspicious of Furby, and they banned Furby from ever entering any NSA grounds. There were concerns they could be used to record and repeat classified information. When he was told this, Roger Schiffman, the CEO of Tiger Electronics, responded to this ban. Although the Furby is a clever toy, it does not record or mimic voices. The NSA did not do their homework. Furby is not a spy! I mean, I don't know who would actually bring a Furby to the National Security Headquarters, but whatever, guys. Honestly, though, nowadays, I think they've gotten the look and design of these Furbies much better, and it's way less creepy. I actually think it's kind of cute now, and potentially some nice company for a child. But that voice is still pretty ear grating. But I almost forgot to mention the most important function of fourth generation Furby. You can squeeze it, and, and apparently it will crap out hot rods. I have no idea why Furby can crap out hot rods, but it can. I know your life isn't any richer for me telling you this, it's possibly poorer, but I thought you should know. And how about number eight? The Magic 8 Ball. Now when you see this, you might just see a plastic sphere, or an oversized snooker ball. But to some, it's a fortune teller. You might even remember seeing Milhouse use one of these in The Simpsons. It was first invented by a guy named Albert in the 1940s. He based it on his mum's spirit writing tool. Of course, like all fortune telling, her spirit writing was totally phony. Using a box, she would secretly write a message in it and pretend to her customers it was a communication from the spirits. Eventually, Albert and his friend Abe sold their tube version of this as the Psycho Slate. Which I have to admit is a way cooler name than Magic 8 Ball. But it didn't sell much, so Abe tried turning it into a crystal ball. They even marketed it using ladies dressed like Roma women in department stores. A good example of this is Esmeralda and Hunchback. Back then they were referred to as gypsies, but I'm not sure if all Roma people appreciate that term nowadays. Anyway, despite these marketing efforts, the crystal ball version also failed. But then, in 1950, it all changed. When Brunswick Billiards turned this crystal ball into an eight ball. And apparently, that was the winning ticket for this stupid invention. A mystical fortune telling device had to look like a snooker ball. Who would have thunk it? In the version we have nowadays, a person asks a yes or no question, then turns it over to reveal a random answer in the window. But back in the 1950s, this magic eight ball was sold as a paperweight despite being ball-shaped and probably rolling off the table. What a stupid paperweight. But I guess that's still more practical than selling it as a fortune-telling device. Nowadays, though, it's just sold as a harmless kid's toy. Sadly, Albert didn't live to see the ridiculous success his Psycho Slate had become. Nowadays, Mattel manufactures the 8-Ball, and they've stated they sell over a million of these stupid oversized billiard balls every year. And at the price this thing sells on Amazon? That's over $10 million a year on this sadly ineffective paperweight. And before we get to number seven, thank you to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video. You might remember me mentioning I tend to stick to foods that are very low in sugar, but I also have a real sweet tooth. And I'm a cereal guy. Every morning I enjoy my cereal. But I recently discovered that Magic Spoon cereal is zero grams of sugar, and I'm like, how? The flavors include cocoa, frosted, fruity, and my favorite, peanut butter. I knew peanut butter would be my favorite. All of them are zero grams of sugar, yet they all keep that sweet and delicious flavor. It's like cereal reinvented or something. They've got this lovely variety pack that comes with all four of these flavors. When I looked at the nutritional label, which I pretty much always do with groceries, the ingredients suited my personal tastes as well. 
It's 13 to 14 grams of protein and 4 to 5 net grams of carbs per serving and 140 calories per serving. Plus, if you do have certain dietary needs, it's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, wheat-free, soy-free, and naturally flavored. I have no idea how they managed all that, yet can still give me a delicious peanut butter cereal. Click the link below to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use the promo code STRIDER at the checkout to get $5 off any order. Or go to magicspoon.com slash strider. And Magic Spoon is so confident with their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll happily refund your money, no questions asked. So click the link below or scan the QR code on the screen and use the code STRIDER to save five bucks on your Magic Spoon cereal. Or go to magicspoon.com slash strider today. Anyway, thank you for listening. With that said, let's continue. And what do we got at number seven? GAC. In many ways, the 90s were a simpler time. There was no smartphones, no social media, and when we needed to tell someone important news, we'd often talk to them face to face. I mean, you could still do that, but for many, it's less likely, you know? But there were definitely some things I don't miss, like all the gross-out humor and fart jokes. Ugh. And Gat capitalized on that tiny window of time in the 90s, where fart jokes were actually funny. Mattel teamed up with Nickelodeon to create this slime toy, and this gross slime really took off. They sold 160,000 of these things in the first three weeks. Assuming they're like seven bucks a piece, that's like 1.1 million right off the bat. And over Xmas, it became a must-have toy under the tree. Well, if you liked farts anyway, which for some reason many of us did. But what even was this ghastly stuff? It felt wet, but it was dry, and it stretched and shaped weirdly around your hands. Oh, I'm kind of with a teacher in this ad. This stuff is freaking weird. Gak might have been a hit because of the popularity of TV shows such as Double Dare or Uh Oh. A slime called Gak was used in these kids' game shows to create a bit of fun. Plus, of course, even to this day, Nickelodeon is famous for its slime. Their slime was so popular, they literally made a slime cereal to eat for breakfast. Yeah, I might miss 90s bands like Aqua, but I don't miss the slime obsession. So with kids running amok with this Gak stuff, how did adults feel about it? Gak! Gak! Why is Gak back? Well, as a commercial predictor, it definitely wasn't loved by teachers. For example, second grade teacher Angie was soon sick of the product. Homeroom was not a good experience. Kids were stretching it across the room, throwing it, bouncing it. They just wouldn't put it away. The product annoyed her so much, she ordered a Gak out which meant no gack in class. What about the parents? What did they think? Nadine's a mum and she said, As a mum, I like that gack is mess free. It's just a great slimy toy that just keeps kids being kids. Yeah, you know, that's a really good point. There's nothing parents have to clean up, but it still feels gross to kids, win-win. What do some of the kids think? Let's ask Nadine's daughter, Leah. It's a super silly and squishy toy. You can stretch it, break it and make funny noises with it. And it makes no mess. I like how slimy it is. And so it was that this vile smear of fudgy pavement waste went on to make millions of dollars and made me grateful and less nostalgic for the gross out 90s. Number six. Slinky, slinky, go, slinky, go. The Slinky. You know the Slinky. Everyone knows of this dippy toy. But you might not know that the Slinky was actually a mistake invention. Richard James, the Slinky's inventor, was tinkering in a shipyard one day, trying to develop springs for rough seas. But he accidentally knocked one of these springs off his table. And it did the thing. That thing it does. It's, it's incredible! It's gonna be some kind of a record! Excitedly, he ran home to tell his wife Betty about it. And he spent the entirety of the next year experimenting. Betty rolled her eyes and was dubious. At least the neighborhood children were excited about it. So they took out a loan and mass produced 400 slinkies to sell, which I'm sure Betty was just thrilled about. But I should have no problem selling a thousand springs. Oh, idiots. Ooh, these are fun. Initially, the slinky didn't see much interest. But once people saw the slinky do the thing, 
that thing it does, they were sold. And thus Slinkies became that moronic, inescapable item that made Betty and Richard hundreds of millions of dollars. Over the next year, they sold a quarter of a million Slinkies. They sold an additional hundred million over the next two years. And to put that in perspective, given inflation today, nowadays that would be a staggering $1.3 billion in sales. Unfortunately, Richard didn't take the fame and fortune of the Slinky very well. And he soon left his wife and family to take up residence in Bolivia to reside in a religious movement. What a charmer. He squandered a lot of the money they made from the Slinky into the cult. But luckily for the Slinky, his wife Betty took over. Before she passed away in 2008, she had sold an additional 250 million Slinkies. That is enough to circle the world with Slinky more than 150 times. It may be a silly mistake invention, but it does that thing, so clearly we all needed one. Number 5. The KFC Romance Novel. Let me trepidatiously introduce you to The Tender Wings of Desire. Set in Victorian England, Lady Madeline Parker is a rebellious rich girl who is betrothed to marry a rich duke all to fulfill her family aristocratic ambition bullcrap. But she wants more for herself. So she steals away in the middle of the night on horseback. And what, did she fall in love with a chicken or something? No, no, no. In a faraway seaside town, she meets Colonel Sanders. Wait, THE Colonel Sanders? Surely that's a joke. Apparently not. In 2020, KFC penned a romance novel as a marketing ploy for Mother's Day, since apparently Mother's Day is one of the best sales days of the year. This Mother's Day, let Colonel Sanders take care of dinner. Oh, I asked my mum and she says that's because many mothers don't want to cook on Mother's Day. And according to Goodreads, over a thousand people want to read or are currently reading this book. Let's see if we can find some reviews. Oh yes, of course it has its own page on Goodreads. Is it a good read? Gail said. This book reads like a typical KFC meal. You probably won't finish it before you begin to feel nauseous and full of regret. Ugh, not as romantic as some readers might have hoped for. What about Nenia? What's her review say? If you were expecting, I boinked Colonel Sanders, you're going to be disappointed. This is not Fifty Shades of Gravy. This is fried and frigidy. To that one person out there who actually wanted a fantasy novel about the Colonel, you have my sympathies. Perhaps the Colonel is better off back in Kentucky, frying his chicken. Now, I realize this choice is a major weasel call since the book's profits aren't shared. But Mother's Day is among the most profitable days for KFC, and I'm sure they made millions in this promotion. But I will make this weasel call up to you. It was hard to find, but I purchased a copy of this book, and I will read you a segment of it. Just a small segment, trust me. A few sentences is all you're gonna want. Would you like to come back to my room? She asked boldly. I'm Kentucky and I say yes. And she could hear in his voice, beyond a shadow of a doubt, he wanted her as much as she wanted him. Let's skip a few pages. Yeah, I'm a colonel. Yeah, I'm fabulously rich. I'm a magnate of the restaurant industry. My dear, the king of an empire built with my bare hands. Now you know everything, and I hope you can still love me. <laughs> of course she still loved him. And we're done. I can comfortably say the reviews were right. It reads more like fried and frigidy, and I feel nauseous and full of regret from even skimming this novel. Let's move on, shall we? So is this a bad time for me to mention there's a game called I Love You, Colonel Sanders? A finger licking good dating simulator? <laughs> yeah, you're right, Boo. He really shouldn't know. Huh? What's all this now? Uh, nothing! Nothing at all! <laughs> Go back to your video. And what do we got for number four? Pogs. Oh yeah, I remember Pogs. If you're old enough, you might remember a game back in the 90s where you slammed down a pile of discs and collected whatever landed face down as your own. Yeah, it sounds really stupid, doesn't it? In Australia, we called them Tarzos. We found them buried in chip packets. They were like marbles, but somehow even more boring. Marbles at least roll on the ground. Pogs can't even manage that. They're just cheap, thin pieces of plastic cylinders. And again, I may make fun, but I have to admit, I collected Pogs as a kid. A lot. 
In fact, no joke, I was Pog obsessed. I collected so many Pogs, but I never actually once played Pogs with anyone. Stack and whack and win, the commercial said. But I just collected them, and this obsession went on for years. I even had a stupid collection book to display these stupid plastic discs. What was wrong with me? It's funny though, because we do see this happen quite often. Think of things like pet rocks or Tamagotchis or Pokemon cards. Sometimes they're a fad, but sometimes kids and adults can even love to collect these long term. So how'd this ridiculous craze start? Well, a businessman named Alan saw there was a milk cap craze in Hawaii, and he saw an opportunity to make boatloads of money. Alan bought the trademark for Pogs and founded the World Pog Federation. And it was an instant hit, making $175 million in the first year. Seeing the potential for growth, he also partnered with Disney, Walmart, and Nintendo. So Pogs were firmly established as a collectible, making kids want them even more. In its peak hype, Pogs could not be restocked quick enough and were said to be making $10 million a week. That is absurd money for essentially pieces of bottle caps. Eventually, copycats even made a homemade Pog maker. They were getting so popular that McDonald's even started handing them over in Happy Meals. Even Pixar promoted a film using Pogs. Anti-drug organizations and even the Pope used Pogs to get their messages across. But then, just as quickly as it started, the spell was suddenly lifted. Suddenly, us kids back then lost interest and the Pogs just faded into obscurity. Not to mention, many schools ended up banning Pogs. They claimed that the game was too much like gambling. I don't know, guys. In 1995, the World Pog Federation filed for bankruptcy. And that was the death of the Pog. Yeah, but that was a fun fad while it lasted. Don't be afraid, it's number three. The Koosh Ball. Aren't they neat? But what is it that's so captivating about these weird strandy balls? I was so fascinated when I first saw them, as you can see, I went out to buy some and juggle them. And I'm certainly not the only one who's bought these. For many years, millions of these zany balls have flown off shelves. The original company that made them, Odds On, said they sold millions and millions for five bucks a piece. Just what are these things though? Well, each one is basically made from 2,000 rubber strands, each stemming from its steel center. I don't know about you, but personally I'm drawn in by the soft feel and bright colors. Yeah, I'm an adult, but I'm also an adult who likes bright and colorful cartoons like Spongebob. And some people like me on the spectrum are drawn to things that feel nice to touch. And I think that's part of why you'll see koosh balls in both toy stores and therapy stores nowadays. It's just kind of relaxing to throw them around, you know? I, I mean, they're stupid pieces of weird rubber strands, but they're fascinating pieces of stupid weird rubber strands. And hey, in your home or office space, there's a definite good chance you have one of these too. Scott came up with the idea in 1987, where he tied rubber bands into a ball to make it easier for his smaller kids to catch the ball. He went on to design a ball made of rubber fibers that were easy to grab by tiny fingers. He then patented and sold these balls and within a year, the Koosh Ball was the hottest gift of the year. By 1997, the Koosh Ball was sold to Hasbro, the toy behemoth, for $100 million. And these things are seriously well loved. I mean, I respect Time Magazine's opinion, but they've called the Koosh Ball one of the 100 greatest toys of all time. I mean, that is high praise. But given I've been tossing these things around for this entire segment, maybe they're onto something. These things are really compelling for me. They're inane, they're silly, but honestly they have a definite purpose and I've thoroughly enjoyed them. So they're definitely not the stupidest item on this list. And good on a parent for designing something to better help their kids. So pardon me if this doesn't quite fit my arbitrary rules, but I wanted to talk about them and I kind of wanted to toss around something different. I might even use these again as juggling balls in the future. And number two, head on. The old placebo is a powerful thing and homeopathy can make some people feel better through this. But more than anything, homeopathy is profitable. The company Meralcus Healthcare discovered this when they started selling people wax. Got a headache? According to the World Health Organization, it's incredibly common. But for some people, rather than going to a chemist or speaking to a doctor, they say, hey, no prescription required, why not? Well, I guess the 20 or 30 dollars they had before they bought the wax. Head-on is an example of a product that made some nonsense claims, 
But because the ad was ridiculously annoying, it made a lot of money. You might have heard it before. I'll only play it once so you don't get it seared in your head like it is mine. Head on, apply directly to the forehead. I think William summed it up quite well on his YouTube comment in this ad. These people had a genius idea. They sold a headache remedy with a commercial that gave people headaches. So what's actually in it apart from wax? Well, chemical analysis of the ingredients was 99.9999999999999 wax. The remaining tiny sliver per quintillion purple iris, as well as a noxious weed called white bryony, which is a lethal berry if more than 40 are consumed. And of course, potassium dichromate, which can also be deeply harmful to human health. But don't worry about this if you have tried it. Like other homeopathy medicines, its ingredients are even less than one part per quintillion. That's 18 zeros. So in other words, you probably have a higher contamination of 200 million year old dinosaur bones from tap water. This stuff is the real deal of stupid. And I'm sad to say, over 6 million tubes of this garbage was sold at $8 each. I feel like we'd all get less of a headache if we gave that $48 million to charity instead. Nowadays, it sells for about 21 bucks on Amazon, but chances are you'll get more headache relief from holding on to your $21, turning the stupid commercial off, sitting in a dark room and having a glass of water. And if it persists, talk to your doctor or chemist, cause head on ain't gonna do jack. Number one. The Chia Pet. How about a Chia Pet? Ch -ch -chia. chia Pets, the pottery that grows. Have you ever been entertained watching grass grow? Probably not. And that's all the Chia Pet does. It just grows chia seeds. It's fun. No, it isn't. It isn't anything. That would imply I feel a single emotion when I look at the Chia Pet. Call me unimaginative, but I just see growing grass on a statue. But apparently, there has been a solid crowd for these things since they were first created in 1977. But it wasn't till 1982 that the Chia Pet really took off. Why? Because they released the Chia Ram. Why the Ram? I just don't get it. Rams are the most basic, dull, boring animal in the entire animal kingdom. And I'm no ram appearance expert, but it's not a particularly pretty ram either. In fact, it's kind of ugly. My eyes! But you know what I think might be responsible for the majority of its success? That notorious commercial jingle. Ch -ch 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 -chia. Ch -ch -ch -chia. I looked in the comments of the original commercial's video, and the highest rated comment pretty much confirmed this. I remember when everyone would say, ch 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 chia in elementary school. I'm so tempted to get one. And everything has been turned into a Chia Pet too. We can see on the website, it's basically just random figurines covered in Chia seeds. In fact, in modern times, it's become this odd YouTube challenge to see what people can turn into Chia Pets. Like this lady called Ali turned her car into a Chia Pet. And channels like Healthy Eaton show the simple steps to make your own Chia Pet. But surely these are things of the past. Surely nowadays no one would buy a Chia Pet. Introducing Chia Pet Jurassic World. Oh gee, they're still going strong. In fact, whatever animated character you can think of, there's probably a stupid Chia Pet for it. There's a Chia Shrek, a Chia Scooby-Doo, a Chia Indiana Jones. And yes, there was most certainly a SpongeBob Chia Pet. And no, I definitely don't want one. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. No, no Chia Pet for me. Thank you. Uh, come on. You want one, don't you, boo? Yeah. All right. Ugh, clearly, I don't get the appeal here. I guess only people like Einstein could appreciate the true hidden genius of the Chia Pet. Oh, look at that. Oh, it's got little fuzzy grass. And if you have a particularly terrible or strange item you can think of, or you have an opinion on the ones I mentioned, feel free to say hi in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching and hope to see you next time. Yeah. Today's member question is from Phoenix Star YT, who's also an editor on my team. His question is, what video you ever made do you think has the most special behind it, either for you or your audience? Uh, I think he's asking which video I've made is the most special to me or gave an important message to the viewer. For credit to him, he taught himself English from Dutch. In my opinion, I think I did some good in the video relatable SpongeBob episodes, as this let me discuss mental health difficulties and how to cope with them, such as agoraphobia, anxiety, insomnia, or 
CD, which I have too. Another one I'm proud of is Most Dangerous Foods because it let me debunk some common food misinformation with proper evidence-based answers. And I get mad when I see this food misinformation, so I was quite passionate about it and I hope that shines through. And it was just a fun video to do, you know. Thanks for the question.